All right, guys. So, hey, we are live. Uh, this is Catching Up with KJ, episode number 70. In parentheses, chatting with Jay Dyer, D-Y-E-R. And uh, if you're not familiar with Jay, then, uh, you know, clip on your seatbelts and slide on your thinking caps because uh, he goes deep. He goes real deep into a lot of different kinds of subjects. But but one really near and dear to my heart, and that's, you know, the media, the uh, connection to the media with all of this and with pop culture and the kind of messages they're really putting out there. And one thing that personally draw, uh, drew me towards Jay's work a long time ago is I found out that at least just watching what he covers, he must be just as big a geek as I am because he's covering like True Detective and uh, David Lynch's work. I love Twin Peaks and I definitely want to talk to you about that tonight too. But without rambling on too much and bringing Jay on, I do want to give you a little background on him if you're not familiar. This is from his website, it's jaysanalysis.com and it says here that uh, um, Jay, oh wait, I don't want to start it there, sorry, okay. Uh, Jay's analysis has grown to become one of the premier film and philosophy. I don't want to do that. All right, let's do this. Jay's the host of Jay's analysis podcast. Is that better? No, and that esoteric works. Hollywood. Okay, cool. And he's also a regular contributor to 21st Century Wire, Soul of the East, and the Espionage History Archive, as well as appearing on numerous nationally syndicated radio shows. And his graduate work focused on the interplay of film, geopolitics, espionage, and psychological warfare. He is a public speaker, lecturer, comedian, and author of the popular title, Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film, which made it to Amazon's number one spot in its first month of release in the film and Hollywood category. Probably wasn't the greatest introduction you ever had, but I was reading it off my phone. However, <laughs> it's nice to meet you, man. Thanks, man. I'm glad to be on here with you. I've, I've followed your work. I've seen a lot of great videos that really have a lot of parallel and crossover with what I talk about. So it's always nice to meet uh, like minds. And I know that you've had some history with the film industry, as you said in some videos. So I definitely think we are a pairing of great minds here. And I look forward to all your insights as well. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. In fact, I'm curious about your background in the film industry. Do you want to talk to me about that? I don't really have a film background per se, but I did grow up really liking theater and uh, I was always involved in the drama team and doing what what we called speech team, which was actually where you you team up with a partner and you do uh, improvised comedy. <clears throat> so we did a lot of like Neil Simon plays and jokes, jokey stuff like that when I was in high school. And I really thought about, <clears throat> excuse me, for a while uh, going into acting and all that but as you get older you realize that the movie industry is not you know what it what it pretends to be so I found a much more interesting intellectually challenging course for my life through studying philosophy and comparative religion theology Bible so I went the route of academics and that took me into oddly enough this the conspiracy realm I, I think back when i was about 21 or 22 i started listening to alex jones and that kind of introduced me to a lot of the ideas of uh, you know the new world order and all that and then simultaneous to that i was doing my undergraduate and then graduate work throughout my 20s and i just the the more academia you do you have a lot more freedom to choose the topics you want to study so i decided to look into topics that combined geopolitics, philosophy, religion, and the film industry all in one. So that's why I did my grad work on on that topic. And so the book that I wrote is really just kind of a, it's not exactly the grad, it's not my grad work, that's a whole different paper, but um, it's a reflection of that same stuff and in, in, in my own interests and basically just looking at films in a different way than most people do. You know, if you watch Roger and Ebert or those old style movie review shows, they're going back and forth about this or that aspect of the film that was good, the technicality of the lighting and this and that, which I'm not denigrating that, but it's kind of boring. I mean, who cares how good the actors were per se? Ultimately, what's the meaning of this film, especially when it comes to, you know, these really, really dark, deep, esoteric top topics or something maybe that's a coded reference to geopolitics or maybe that's a coded, you know, symbolic redemption message in terms of theology, you know, all of these things find their way into films. And a lot of times it just flies over people's heads. So what I tried to do in the book was to boil that down and make it understandable in, in terms of all of its depth 
and interconnections from all of these different angles of looking at film. Well, with all the, with such a diverse background and uh, so many different areas that you're interested in, was there some kind of, if you'll excuse the excuse, like, you know, a triggering event? Was there a movie you saw or a song you heard or, you know, whatever it was, was there something that brought all of this stuff together for you? Cause you really have the eyes for it, you know? Well, I was raised in a small town in Tennessee and, when you grow up in the 80s and 90s in Tennessee, there's no, there's nothing to do except for people either did yeah. drugs and meth or they played guitar uh, or they were interested in the arts in some way. So my buddies and I, we were all kind of on the artsy side of things. And I think we rented probably every VHS that our small town had in the movie store. So we were really drawn to film. And uh, I remember certain films always stuck out, you know, back when I was in high school, I didn't know any of this stuff or have any interest in it. I was just interested in chicks. Uh, but the, uh, the ones that stood out were the ones that were more symbolic and very difficult to decode. I remember watching Barry Lyndon. And even though it's kind of pretty obvious what the movie's about, I noticed there was things going on that were, that were trying to send a message. And I didn't really know how to interpret that yet because I hadn't studied Kubrick and I hadn't looked into history and, the yeah. ideas of you know the british warfare uh imperial system and class warfare and all that um i remember watching 2001 when i was about 17 and i had no idea what that movie was about i remember watching lost highway by david lynch no oh, idea yeah. what that was so so a lot of those kind of films and then you start realizing once you kind of put your foot into the waters of conspiracy that there's a whole lot of conspiracy in movies and I remember going to the theater and watching Conspiracy Theory with Mel Gibson in 1997. And that one probably really stuck out as the most memorable one because, you know, that film actually has quite a bit in it. It has not just the ideas of like programmed assassins and MK Ultra, but kind of references the whole of what would become conspiracy culture absolutely and uh, you know you know they do this obviously on purpose right yeah. but right. but also with that film just something about mel gibson i saw a movie uh, i guess fairly new of his from a few years ago called the gringo the other night and i watched that it was really good but yeah I've seen he's, it. He, buddy, i'd love to sit down and talk to him because he knows what's going on out there clearly you know mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a Richard Donner film, and Richard Donner has made uh, a couple conspiracy-related movies. And believe it or not, I actually think Goonies is a conspiracy-related movie, and that's a Dick Donner film. <clears throat> I have a really weird take on Goonies, which people can Google if they're interested. But um, yeah, it, it, you, you can really approach most big blockbusters this way, because I really think that those are the ones that they... In, encode with a lot of the messages to really propagandize the populace because that's what most people are going to be seeing you know james bond that kind of stuff and then nowadays the marvel sci-fi blockbuster stuff but it also comes up in a lot of the lesser known obscure films too so i always try to balance the big you know known films with the more obscure stuff yeah same here yeah absolutely i've found some really interesting indie films out there throughout yeah. the years that, that have a lot to say. There was a one a while back called The Veil with, uh, I can't remember the actor's name, but I think, um, oh gosh, I just can't remember these actors' names very well, but it's called The Veil, and it had a lot to say about the Archons. It was about a cult huh. of Archons and people letting themselves be, be possessed and things like this, and it was pretty heavy, but go ahead. Well, that's funny. I, I I'm not familiar with that film. I'll have to check it out. But, uh, you know, that idea is ancient. And that's one of the things I talk about in the first chapter of the book is looking back to Plato. You know, what I did my undergrad work on was philosophy. So I had a lot of ancient philosophy. And that's one of the topics I discuss quite a bit at my website and in my videos and talks. And that's because Plato is crucial to understanding not just Western civilization, but also conspiracy, because everything that's the socialist, Marxist, Illuminist Republican Vyshop type tradition that originates in Plato. And Plato really is kind of the forefather of the Republican socialist Marxist idea of government. But he didn't just write about politics and metaphysics and the esoteric. He also has dialogues that talk about quite a bit of gods slash mythological slash esoteric stuff. So he has a dialogue called Ion where he has the character of Socrates actually debating with poets and music musicians. And they're talking about the process of 
probably through drugs. You know, we know that from the, the history of the Oracle at Delphi that people would, in the religious ceremonies, they would, they would use different probably opiates or hallucinogenic types of drugs to induce that altered state of consciousness. Uh, and so this whole dialogue, which is not very long, you can find it online, it's called ION, ION, uh, they discuss this Dionysian berserk madness fervor that the artist goes into in order to channel the inspiration of the muse or the god. So this is a principle, an idea that is ancient, and you can follow that all the way up through the British globe theater tradition of the Renaissance, Shakespeare. Hey, well, I wonder if Kundalini's uh, connected with that at all. Anything? That's interesting because what I was going to say is that you go all the way up to the modern era and the father of method acting, which is the whole principle of, you know, what a lot of the A-listers are into, where they try to become possessed by the soul or person that they're portraying in the film or play. You know, this is something yeah. Jeremy Irons is into. Denzel Washington has talked about it. Uh, Robert De Niro, you know, any of the A-listers, Christian Bale, they'll, they'll talk often or, or make reference to this method acting. And so what's interesting is if you read uh, Konstantin Stanislavski, who is the father of modern method acting, that's what he says. He says the idea is that the conscious person or personality in the mind, the goal of the method acting process is actually to suppress that move that person into the background or the subconscious to allow some other consciousness to step forward and take over. Wow, that's so, like a, yeah. it's MP Ultra style. That's exactly. self hypnosis. It's even that thing. Like I've talked about this in the past, the idea of the secret and all that. I mean, I think there are obviously very real concepts involved there that are true. You know that you know uh, your energy flows where your intention goes and things like this. And we we can be in a respect a creator of our own reality, co creators. But uh, that's where I think a lot of that stuff has gone wrong. Even with the prosperity ministers, it reminds me of like Joel Austin, these people that force you into this constant state of happiness. And uh, that's just unrealistic to me. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, those guys are laughable in terms of <laughs> their their fraud aspects. And I've done a lot of research, interestingly, into the history of the Pentagon in a lot of those uh, evangelical. I'm not dissing every evangelical, but I'm saying that a lot of the missionary groups, they have been fronts for CIA and Pentagon operations overseas. And if you, you can actually find mainstream articles about this too, but it also comes up uh, in the history of covert warfare or what's called soft power. So what, what they'll do is they'll set up a missionary organization or the auspices of spreading the gospel or helping people or whatever. And what they're actually doing is setting up foreign covert operations to either move drugs at times, human trafficking at times. Um, it could be exchanging information covertly. It could be all, all kinds of different stuff. But this is, there is a real precedent for this. A lot of books have been written on this, actually. And so I, I, I tend to view the big uh, TV preachers as just another arm of that kind of controlled aspect of the establishment that's geared towards one section of the population, you know, the, the shut-ins or, or, you know, whoever that, you know, so it's not just like, it's not just Creflo dollar asking for your dollar. Right. I mean, that's like big red flag, that name Creflo <laughs> dollar. Right. Uh, there's also some of these guys are really shady with their uh, government connections, their uh, deep state connections. And uh, if you look into the history of Paul Crouch, for example, you'll find that. Well, I actually had a uh, I had a guest on uh, uh, I guess a few months ago now, but Jacob Israel, he's a man that he's on YouTube, makes some videos and whatnot, and does a lot of really good work. But uh, his his history, his story is fantastic. But he actually worked for one of the biggest Christian broadcasting groups for many years, and he's met all of those big preachers. And you know, I just kept trying to get the grease out of him to tell us what was going on. But you know, I'm sure there's disclaimers. Plus, you know, we got to be respectful and all that. But you know, he basically said that, you know, they're all, none of them really even know Jesus the way they act. You know what I mean? Sure. Or they're just basically, they're businessmen, you know, and narcissists. So, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah, I was looking into the history of uh, the Jesus people movement. That's fascinating because not just the Jesus people in the 60s out in California, but if you read Dave McGowan's book on the history of Laurel Canyon, which is the origins of the hippie music scene. Oh, yes. He's yeah, his, you know, his thesis that it's kind of a, basically an engineered test tube 
for the creation of culture creation, which I think is what the CIA is largely involved in domestically. Well, he also hints at times uh, about the Jesus People movement being an engineered CIA operation. And you can actually find some research on that too online. Uh, but some of the groups that spin off of it were, were very scary. One of which was a mind control cult called the Children of God. And that had oh, yeah. know, ties directly into Hollywood with River Phoenix and Rose McGowan grew up in that, in that cult. So a lot of the Hollywood uh, people had a tie into that cult and it's cult the cult leader moses slash david berg was actually convicted of pedophilia and was using all this mind control you know for his own perverse desires so so that I mean that there's a lot of precedent for this kind of stuff and it always ties back into hollywood absolutely that just mentioning river phoenix brought me back to johnny depp i did a video on the website a while back just a compilation of things mm -hmm. about uh, johnny depp in general and and how deep he really is one of the keys to understanding how deep at least satanism goes into hollywood he's he's all over the place and uh, it even looks like in many respects that river phoenix very well could have been a sacrifice you know uh, so that cult connection is interesting as well just want to throw that out there yeah i remember it was in i think vanity fair where river phoenix talked about that cult and then he's mysteriously were told you know overdoses in the viper room and the Viper Room is the club that I guess uh, Johnny Johnny Depp at one time owned. I don't know if he still owns it or yeah. not. But but yeah, and I've seen. I don't. Uh, I, you know, you never know what these Hollywood types are really into. I mean, I mean, who knows if they're telling the truth? But I've seen articles talking about chaos magic, and he does seem to run in the circles of people with interest in chaos magic. So I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll jump back to real quick, just talking about film, you know, we're talking about the movies that really inspired you and kind of woke you up. And I mean, the one that really shocked me into the kind of reality I was never able to get out of again was Eraserhead. I saw that when I was 16 mm. years old. And uh, that's why I've always been a huge David Lynch fan. Uh, you know, maybe not for, you know, his, uh, he's got some pretty unusual spiritual practices and, and things and whatever, mm -hmm. you know, what it's fine, but for his vision, you know, he's uh, just, I think he's an amazing, you know, he's, he just creates these worlds that nobody else can in so many ways. But what are some of your thoughts there, man? I don't want to take you off subject if you wanted to finish up on anything, but uh, if you're interested, I'd like to hear your thoughts on. Well, one of the, on. yeah, one of the things I do talk about in my book is, a lot of the cults that do tie into Hollywood. And so children of God, it's probably mentioned in the book. I don't, I don't have like a whole chapter or anything on it, but there's so many that do tie into Hollywood, which I think is fascinating. And it does tie into MK ultra and MK ultra actually does make a pretty sizable part of my book because that's such a recurring theme in Hollywood. And I think that's uh, not by accident. It's not just a popular, subject matter that you know they're kind of symbiotically feeding off what the public likes and responds to although it's probably become that nowadays with you know lady gaga and carrie katie perry even talking about the illuminati openly it's kind of become yeah. this self-feeding meme and marketing technique but i also think there's a very real aspect behind all this because uh if you look into the the documentaries and studies that have been done on multiple personality and DID, a disassociative identity disorder. I think this is a very real thing. And I also think that you can go back to the eighties when the satanic panic happened. If you know about the history of the false memory syndrome foundation and it being kind of a front, then you, I, this is my own theory that I've come across in recent research. I, I'm starting to think that some of the big cases that came out in the seventies and eighties, like Sybil uh, or Michelle remembers, if you look into the history of those people and their cases, they seem to be fakes. There's a lot of evidence to suggest they were fakes. I think that that was done on purpose because it's a real phenomenon and it really happens. And if you watch, I've watched, I think, every documentary I could find on YouTube on multiple personality, DID and schizophrenia, <clears throat> tons of them. What you'll notice is that every person who manifests, you know, the severest forms of DID they had serious cases of abuse, ritual abuse, every one. This comes up in every one of the documentaries, every wow. case. Yeah, across the board. I've never seen or I've read books on it too. I've never read a book where this isn't mentioned. So I think what they did was that they released some fake stories that could easily be shot down 
and were meant to be shot down like Sybil, right? And then that clouds the air because when you look into, I think the name is Orn, O-H-R-N-E, and these different people that were involved in the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, they're all directly out of the CIA. And their, <laughs> their job was to erect this thing that would deflect and basically be disinformation for looking into the phenomenon. And so <clears throat> for a long time, they were saying that there's no such thing as DID. It's, it's a, for example, people in other countries would say, oh, that's an American phenomenon because it only happens in America. Uh, therefore, it can't be a real phenomenon because it would be happening across the globe. Well, that, number one, assumes that the rest of the world has the American psychiatric approach. They don't. There's a lot of countries that are very backwards that don't have modern medicine. And I'm not saying everything about modern medicine is good, but I'm saying they don't have the infrastructure to diagnose it that way. A lot of countries might be more third world or oriented towards uh, older animistic or pagan spirituality. So they might be calling something spirit possession that's equivalent to DID or whatever DID is. So you see what I'm saying? So that was a, that was yeah. a long time critique that has now been debunked because there are British studies and British documentaries where, Oh, what do you know? It's happening in Britain now too. And we're diagnosing this and we uh -huh. can't. Yep. Yeah. They got the United States of Terra now on TV right before your eyes. Uh, yeah, you know exactly. I do. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, though, man, that's a great idea with Sybil and all those being fake news, because um, I immediately draw the parallel to all of the mass shootings and all the kind of hoax events we have, because I see a thing in these communities where everyone thinks, of course, every, that everything's a hoax. But I definitely yeah. think the mix like it really is. Some of these people are under mind control yeah. like the neighbor, the Arch, or Aurora, Aurora. Um, you know, some of the stuff's false flags and then there are hoaxes. And so they're throwing in, they're peppering in these hoaxes to create that kind of mentality, right? Like, Oh, nothing's real, you know? Yeah. Well, I've, I know two people in my life, not me, but, uh, two people I've known for a long time who have exhibited those uh, symptoms or tendencies of something like having alternate personalities. Uh, for example, people who you, were very bad on drugs and had some very dark experiences and they would kind of switch into a different mode where it was obviously somebody else there. Um, and I know these people very well. They weren't faking family members, stuff like that. So I, I think this is uh, a real phenomenon just based on my own empirical experience. But then when you read a lot of stuff and you watch these documentaries, I don't think all these are fake. These aren't all fake documentaries. These are real places where <clears throat> You know, people are at these psychiatric institutions. They're not all actors. Uh, you can read the works of Dr. Colin Ross, who's kind of a pioneer, and he's one of the big defenders of the idea of DID and it being real. Uh, his books talk about this a lot. He's in all the documentaries on it, by the way. <clears throat> um, and he's very aware of the ritual abuse. Now, one reason, another reason I don't think that's, that's all fake is that uh, how many news stories and big time scandals have come out about the ritual abuse amongst British elites and U.S. elites, right? I mean, Saville, Sandusky, there's, there's cases of this in Australia that are mainstream documentaries even. I'm not even, I'm not even talking about conspiracy websites. I just mean mainstream news. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't think that it's accidental that we're seeing it in a lot of these Western countries precisely because the power structure in those countries seems to be pretty much demonic. Well, do you think, here's just kind of jarring off on that, but the whole Pizzagate thing that blew up, I mean, I see different modes of thought on that. Some people think that the Pizzagate thing was the leak, you know, the hoax by the by the enemy to, you know, give, uh, you know, make everyone go crazy on this, be some kind of a red herring for whatever reason. And then other people believe that, you know, it's, it really started off with 4chan and, and uh, some of these smaller groups. They put it out to the YouTube. Next thing you know, it's on mainstream media all over the place. So when you see things like that, you know, I mean, these these concepts still apply of fake news here and there to mix up the truth. Why do you think that's all coming out right now? Is it kind of like what you're saying that basically they can't hold it back any longer? Uh, if, if, uh, there's always at once a whole bunch of different things happening. So you can have real people leaking things. Um, you can have those leaks being done and allowed by larger power groups without the people underneath them, the leakers perhaps, knowing the big picture. So a lot of times, and there's some good articles that I've done and that 
that we've done at 21st Century Wire that talk about targeted leaks. And that's fascinating. If you look into that subject, you can find <clears throat> that it's, it's not that the, the information is always necessarily false. It could be, it could be complete fabrication, but, but that the, the timing and who the leaks are about is oftentimes a good indicator of who's behind the leaks. So for example, there was the, the Panama leaks, the Panama leaks from uh, uh, Panama about a Panama. year ago. Right. And when you look into who was behind that, it was, uh, I believe that it was the Tides Foundation, uh, Ford Foundation. They were funding the people that leaked that. So that was done. That was a targeted leak for for a purpose to make certain people, Putin and others, uh, look bad. <laughs> right. While at the same time, it cloaks the people who are their enemies, the Soros types who you know fund the Tides Foundation, things like that. So we can't be too naive about leaks and who's behind them. And we don't always know who's behind them and what's going on. I, I did a lot of uh, video reports on WikiLeaks and my skepticism about WikiLeaks, not because I think that the information was false. I think most of the information, as far as I could tell, especially in the last few leaks, Vault 7 and then back to the Podesta emails, I think that's all real. Well, speaking but it was, of cults, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, but, but it was leaked at a certain time for a reason by, uh, you know, maybe factions that, that don't like uh, Hillary. Uh, there's a large Jewish Israeli contingent that that has for a long time not liked the Clintons and the Clinton Foundation. Uh, now that doesn't mean that I'm saying that the Clintons are innocent and no, no, no. I think they're totally corrupt. But I'm just saying that you can have even at kind of a higher level, mm -hmm. you know, different like mafia groups that don't like each other. Sure, they all. I've always said that the secret society uh, they fight against each other as well. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the cults and WikiLeaks, have you ever seen anything on Julian Assange? being associated with the family, that cult. Yeah, I remember the first person to say that uh, back in around 2006 or seven was Tarpley. Uh, and I think Webster Tarpley's kind of discredited himself, so I don't really put a whole lot of stock in that. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But, but uh, I mean, it could be possible, you know, I mean, he could be, he could have been raised in some CIA cult. I wouldn't be, none of it would, would surprise me, but I don't really know if I don't have, I haven't verified that. Yeah, I'm with you because I just did a video. I put the, some, the family information in there because it really was a deal run by the CIA. However, mm -hmm. that Assange stuff I stumbled on and like you, you know, I kind of looked around to see where did this even originate? And I really, mm -hmm. I didn't even find Tarpley. I just found again, kind of just conspiracy communities here and there talk right. about it. So yeah, we got to be careful with stuff like that and you're saying earlier too that you've seen all these movies on mind control as well i was mm -hmm. thinking and you know you see what they're doing uh let's say there's some new person listening out there tonight or once this is uploaded and they're new to this whole thing is there any one movie off the top of your head you could suggest to them that makes them so right in your face with the mind control so blatant is there anything like that that comes to mind that's a good question um depends on how weird you want to go there's there's a ton obviously off the top of my head the first one that sticks out which i didn't put in the book uh but is completely about this topic is the john cusack movie identity oh wow yeah that's i never thought of that angle either actually i saw that years ago loved it yeah because and i'm not going to spoil it but, but but the whole film is about alters and and the different personas of alters told in a very unique way uh I think that the the whole idea of the altars is kind of played out in Hollywood because it's, a, <laughs> yeah. it's like there's endless movies on that topic now. But uh, that one is an interesting, unique presentation of it. I, I think most of the David Lynch movies have this theme to some degree, um, but they're not linear movies. So they're, they're a lot of times hard to decode. Uh, so if I was just going to pick like one introductory or two introductory movies that really present this, I would say identity, uh, Jacob's ladder, the, um, Adrian Lynn film, yeah, uh, great one. Tim Robbins. And then, um, maybe either the old or the new Manchurian candidate. Those are kind of classics, but, uh, Oh yeah. Yeah. And I, I see the old Manchurian candidate as, predictive programming for the JFK situation because that actually came out before JFK and the whole plot is the the character being mind controlled to be this to be a guy who's going to assassinate a presidential type <laughs> figure. Now I think it's a vice president in the movie but still 
you know, both the film and that novel came out prior to the, the JFK thing. So I've always seen that as predictive programming. For sure. Or lesser magic even. Yeah. You know, that's mm -hmm. very interesting. And when you were talking about, okay, we might go weird with the movies. I was thinking of this, I'm going to offshoot, but for anyone listening that, you know, doesn't understand the symbols in movies and things like this, at least associated with what we call the Illuminati and everything, you could go watch El Topo. I thought you might yeah. mention that. And Holy Mountain's another one. So I can't remember the man's name that makes those films, but Jodorowsky. Uh, okay, Jodorowsky. Okay, cool. And man, he's on another level anyway. But no, please continue. So so those are some good good choices though. Jacob's Ladder is a great one. And now that you mentioned identity, I totally see it. I just hadn't thought of that movie in so long, but wow, it really is right there, you know. Yeah, and I want to say why, but if I do, it'll give it away, and I don't want to spoil it everybody. But but that is what the movie's about, and it, it's about trauma-based mind control, basically. Um, yeah, and then um, there's some bad ones, too, like some really crap movies that do have this aspect to it, like uh, Hide and Seek with um, Dakota Fanning and Robert De Niro. I remember that one. No, this is like a really... <laughs> a very badly rated movie. Uh, I think Rotten Tomatoes gives it like 4%. Or something like <laughs> but, but it's, it's not that bad because when you watch it, you're like, Oh, okay. You know, th there's some serious trauma based mm -hmm. mind control going on here. And it's generational in that movie actually. Right. Yeah. And then you've got, your, then you got your American ultras. Did you see American ultra? I did. Yeah. I did a, a analysis of that too. Uh, oh, good. I see, I, I just subbed your, like, I didn't even know you are doing YouTube, man. I've, I've seen all your other work in other places online. And I think you contributed to uh, uh, the a book from Freeman and them. I'm pretty sure, right? Weird Wild, Wild World or something, or am I wrong here? Uh, no, not directly. Um, oh, weird stuff, okay. I just, I think that's where I first found information on Esoteric Hollywood, and that's where I went from there. But go ahead, man, sorry. Well, I, I, I helped Jamie edit some of the chapters in her book and correct some of the information. So I was kind of a hidden editor of her Hollywood book. But um, I, there's so many of these. I don't want to pass up any good ones. I was thinking here, looking at my book. Um, well, actually, Eyes Wide Shut. Now, obviously, I'll give you a d disclaimer. That's kind of a, a gross, uh, dark movie. But the, but the Bill character and the Alice character, they are, in a way, victims of mind control. Uh, now, they're not necessarily having alters or we, the Nicole Kidman character might be because she acts like she doesn't remember being at these rituals. But who knows? Uh, so, you know, Eyes Wide Shut's always one that I recommend. Um Oh man, there's so many. Well, I, I want to ask because you may have actually covered this, but have you ever looked into any of uh, the stuff with Kubrick? Like, you know, what was his relationship? I always wonder with all these producers and people behind the scenes because he put so much in his films, so much truth. Like, I wonder what that world was like. I saw a few years ago that I guess his daughter did an interview with Alex Jones. I watched mm -hmm. it. She really didn't give a whole lot away, it didn't seem. But I mean, have you heard anything, know anything, any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, well, she, as far as I know, is a Scientologist, uh, or at least has been. Oh, yeah. So okay, enough said. So that yeah. I think is is interesting. But uh, the first ninety, eighty, or ninety pages of my book is dedicated to Kubrick. So I, I dissect um, The Shining, Eyes Wide Shut, and Two Thousand One, and they're you know pretty long chapters and in, in, in depth. So I go into all of the esoteric aspects from my perspective I, di I differ with you know a lot of the other people who do this analysis like i don't agree with everything that jay weedner puts in his right. uh, yeah i think he's insightful i've learned stuff from him i'm not totally dissing it but uh, i take a different approach to like the shining i think the shining is a statement about america and there being kind of a dark demonic underbelly to the history of america i think that was what was stephen king's point in the story and interesting i, I see uh I see Kubrick continuing that even with his alterations to be, that's the essence of the story. I'm not saying it doesn't have any re relationship to the moon stuff. It could, I'm not denying that, but I just think it's basically a, a story of demonic possession basically. And the, the Jack Torrance care, the Jack Torrance character ends up possessed. <laughs> I always, I always uh, have to do my, I, I'm going into my <laughs> alters here and I'm joking. 
<laughs> yeah, funny. right. Someone's going to just clip that part. Be yeah. like, here's his altar coming out. You know. Yeah, my favorite line is when he's like, "Well, my wife Wendy's a confirmed horror film fanatic." What's but what's <laughs> weird about that is that Wendy is not just a horror film fanatic. If you pay attention to the books in her house, in the early scenes in the apartment, she's got books on Wicca and the goddess and witchcraft. Yeah, wow, nice catch. I never noticed. And that. she's reading J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye. Right, which is supposed to be the whole mind oh, control, man. yeah, dissociative book. So Wendy, I'm sorry, but in Catcher in the Rye, don't, don't, it, it kind of hints at an, an Illuminati type group, like some hidden controllers as well, right? Yeah, the the cold uh, Holden Caulfield character is uh, basically turned yeah. into a nihilistic, you know, has no morals and. Uh, you know, he's, it's, it's kind of about assassinating and killing with, without any compunction. So yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, now some people argue that it actually is some kind of manual. I don't know if that's true. I mean, I know that's kind of a conspiracy meme it's in conspiracy theory, right? I mean, the, the Mel Gibson character, every time he goes into a bookstore, he has to buy a copy of catcher in the rye. So I, you know, maybe that's true. I don't know. I, I don't have any opinion on that. I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't true. Maybe they, maybe people in the military, you know, at a certain level, like they force them to read this stuff. There is some precedent for that with people who go into Delta force, special forces, like they'll put them through really strange, rigorous trainings. Uh, and then like after, you know, some weird thing, like where you're living in the desert for a week, then suddenly you've got to read, you know, like Machiavelli and write a paper on it. I'm not joking. There's like these weird. Wow. That's very interesting. Yeah, there's some real, real stuff like that. So maybe they make, you know, Delta force dudes read J.D. <laughs> Salinger. I don't, I don't know. I have no hey, idea, but I wouldn't be surprised, but well, I went through the military and I, I was just coast guard, which really isn't that hardcore, you know, but mm -hmm. it's like, even that boot camp was mind control. Like I yeah. was heavily mind controlled for, uh, I mean, it took a few weeks to finally start finding your personality again. And, you know, you get out there in the real world again, but man, there for a while, man. Yeah. So it, it works, you know? Absolutely. And it's actually, uh, MK ultra and the mind control whole, the whole history of all that it's intimately tied to the military because that's precisely what boot camp is. It's a breaking down of the persona to be built back up in the image of what the state wants. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> great movie for that is full metal jacket by Kubrick, which, Yes. It's not that great of a movie. It actually kind of abruptly ends in a weird place. But that is the message of that movie because the the big sort of oafish dude uh, who loses it, right? I mean, he basically snaps and he snaps. becomes... He's frightening, yeah. Yeah. But the weird part of the movie is the Joker character, who's the, the main dude for the most of the movie, He's when it transitions into Act 2 and Act 3, it's all about him undergoing all this trauma and how he processes it as just the normal dude. And then the William Baldwin character is the other, he's the next psycho assassin. He's the dude who, you know, keeps a tally of like the fingernails of the dudes that he kills. <laughs> right. You know, like the, uh, I think it's the Marlon Brando character in apocalypse. Yeah, now, yeah. Right. Well, all of that is the Phoenix program. And the Phoenix program is an aspect of MK Ultra, which was the creation of the psychos in Vietnam to kill men, women, and children amongst the Viet Cong. That's a real CIA program. Wow, man. And, and you know, you mentioned Dave McGowan earlier, who uh, I believe rest his soul, right? He passed away a while back, I yeah. believe. Am I wrong? Okay. But, uh, and he did program to kill, which was another one of those things back when I first kind of woke up around 11 or 2011, 2012-ish. Mm-hmm stuff that really just kind of broke me in and in fact i want to do a, his videos are still up on youtube and a lot of them don't even get the views I, I wish they did so i thought about doing a compilation of his stuff of course giving him credit and putting it on the website i try mm -hmm. to do stuff like that and keep a lot of the they would say older information alive but nobody else can do it like that and that's what i was going to ask you because he did a lot on the connection between mind control mm -hmm. and serial killers i mean what do you know about that no i, I see you've covered some of that i'm curious about your thoughts uh, yeah, actually, I did a two-hour talk uh, on Program to Kill about a month ago. Um, and then I also did a two-hour talk on uh, Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon. And part of the reason I did that was that the Dave McGowan Facebook group has promoted a lot of my stuff. So I was doing that. To, anytime I do a talk, I always promote the book. 
uh, so I was promoting Dave's books and um, yeah, I, I had not read Program to Kill until recently. So I'd read most of the kind of known MK Ultra books that are out there, like uh, John Marx's book or Walter Boert books, that kind of stuff, Peter Lavenda books. Uh, but Dave's book is actually a whole other angle on MK Ultra, which most people miss because he got the fact that the Phoenix program was tied into domestic stuff. So it wasn't just that they were letting loose psychos and creating psychos in Vietnam. It's also that that program is mirrored domestically in the U.S. with these so-called serial killers. So his theory is very interesting, and it's that it's, it has multiple layers and aspects to it. So he's not saying that there's absolutely no serial killers or that there's uh, never been any mass murderers or anything like that, but rather it's the, the media was there to kind of co-opt and craft it into what, as the gatekeepers of psychological warfare of the establishment, what they wanted these stories to be. So they kind of yeah. crafted the serial killer out of, you know, maybe some deranged wackos, maybe some vets that came back who were psycho and actually did one or two, maybe three murders oh, or something like that. Right, breaking so the what they would, and doing this chair. And so what they would, what they did was, ah, this program works so well in Vietnam and breaking down the Viet Cong. Why don't we terrorize the public through the crafted narrative of the serial killer in the U.S. Right, which leads to all the objectives of the technocracy, you know, the atomization of society, all the kinds of stuff that the whole purpose of mass communications is for is for propaganda and traumatizing the mass consciousness. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so, so that's Dave's overall thesis. And then he also talks about things like if uh, a certain police department needed to clean up some open cases, why not stack those on a convenient serial <laughs> killer? Right? Like uh, the idea that Henry Lee Lucas or somebody like that, you know, killed a hundred or 200 people. It seems pretty fantastical. Uh, yeah, not, yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's an interesting case for sure. And then the other thing, just like Dave theorized in Laurel Canyon, is that a lot of the serial killers have this military intelligence background or their families. And so they would talk about, like Henry Lee Lucas talked about being part of this cult called the Hand of Death uh, down yeah. around the Texas-Mexico border. And it was, of course, because he's the killer and he says this, nobody believed him. They're like, oh, yeah, whatever. You're a psycho, sicko, and you're just making this up. But then uh, the a lot of the details that he talked about later on were actually verified when the Texas Rangers raided some ranch where he said there were people being held captive, part of the cult, and that turned out to be true. So there's mm. other weird connections with other cults, like the Matamoros cult, which is a uh, like a Juarez out of Juarez, Mexico, this weird kidnapping ritual cult that seemed to have these intelligence ties too. So I think Dave's pretty pretty accurate probably in that thesis. That's, yeah, absolutely fascinating stuff, man. And yeah, the... Henry Lee Lucas was around my neck of the woods where I grew up in the Midwest, and I've heard all those stories as well. Mm -hmm. And and uh, but it really sticks out as the interview with David Berkowitz I saw a while back, where he was straight up talking about this as well that he was part yep. of a cult, a satanic cult, and he'd been possessed, and the dog was telling him to kill people. So, and uh, I guess it's you know no surprise that we still see elements of that at play today, like the Aurora Kid that always kind of stood out to me, and also the young man at the naval school or the uh, naval shipyard mm -hmm. shooting. Uh, talking about being programmed for days before it happened. He heard voices in his head. I mean, what do you think about that? They're still, in fact, probably probably perfecting it at this point, I imagine. Yeah, and, you know, we, we'll never know, you know what I mean? Because uh, I've written a lot of articles with Patrick Henningsen, uh, and we did one, for example, on the Chattanooga shooting, I think, of last year. And what was weird about that is that it had these military aspects and connections to them, uh, to it. And what happens in every one of those big shooting events is that the FBI uh, or the, if it's in Tennessee, it's the TBI, uh, right? It, it, the Fed, any of these feds or statewide groups, they'll come in and they shut it down because they say it's terrorism, therefore national security. So once it's shut down, there's this uh, feedback loop to where the only knowledge that we or anybody gets of the event is what they give to the press. 
Yeah, that's so I mean, we, I, I, the, they have ahead. it that way so that you can't figure it out. You can't call and find out the death certificates. You know, you, you'll you'll never know, and that's on purpose. And I think that that obviously makes it shady, and <laughs> that's so that nobody can ever figure it out. But uh, yeah. you know, I don't know what to say about the specific shootings like Aurora or. Uh, I mean, I think there was obviously predicted programming with the Batman stuff, and I wrote about that at the time uh, in my Batman Dark Knight analysis. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised, especially given that the the Holmes character was involved in Salk Institute brain interface studies, you know, mm -hmm. DARPA stuff. So I wouldn't be surprised. But, you know, like you were saying earlier, uh, we've gotten to a point where society is really losing its mind um absolutely, absolutely. so there, yeah. you, so you yeah. could you could ha just as easily have a completely staged crisis actor situation as you could people losing it well that brings to mind sandy hook of course i mean what are your any thoughts on sandy hook i mean i found uh, it really interesting is uh, that whole story kept going on and, and they you know the on stream are the on the uh, online people talking about it and you know unfiltered and then the mainstream narrative playing out side by side but as time went on they started finding a lot of interesting satanic kind of connections to that town itself and so the most interesting theory i've heard there is that it was basically a cult town a satanic cult town connected to the the Illuminati and the military, the government and everything else, and that that's that was all a part of it. I've just seen bits and pieces, and I know it's hard to just say, okay, I'm all in on this, but I thought that was interesting. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I don't claim to know exactly what went down. Obviously, I'm a skeptic about it. Uh, I don't think that it's a, anything like what we're told. Uh, what I have been able to verify is that you're right. There are these planned communities and you can look this up. They're UN Cities Initiatives. And what they'll do is, the these are secret programs, by the way. Uh, not many people know about this. Um, they will try to co-opt local mayors. I'm not saying it's every city, but that, obviously they eventually want to make it every city. And so what it is... I'm, is I'm, I'm loving this, by the way. Please go. It's great. Well, so what the the it's it's tied into like Agenda 21 and all that stuff. And what the UN does is they come and they say... Oh, uh, we want to, you know, we'll put money into these different civic projects and we're going to fly you, the mayor, out to whatever hookers you want to <laughs> have or whatever. And uh, uh, but what you got to do is sign us on secretly to a uh, mayor's initiative by the U.N. And we get to come in and we'll mark areas of your town as U.N. heritage sites. So I've had this happen recently here out in the middle. I live in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee. And then suddenly there's these UN initiatives that have marked it as a heritage site. Wow. Like the whole downtown of an area. And I'm thinking, what does the UN have to do with this little downtown? Well, then suddenly you get these giant theaters built, like a big amphitheater, and you get the whole downtown renovated. This is where it ties into gentrification. And uh, Catherine Austin Fitz, who I've done several shows with, has done a whole lot of research in explaining how gentrification is actually part of the scam of the new world order. It's all, it's tied into the, the drug trafficking. It's tied into the UN agenda 21. She's all got a great expose of all that, but to make a long story short, that was kind of what was in the background of Sandy hook was this, uh, UN, I forget the exact name of the program, but they have a million programs, but some, uh, safe cities, uh, mm -hmm. uh gun free city type thing. Yeah, I've heard of some of this, and you're right. I mean, you know, we know they've been trying to move us into the cities for a long time now. Yep. And what's, what's interesting, I'm from a fairly small town, but, you know, I've seen, I'm have seen i seeing it grow now. And it's almost like now they're like, fine, we'll just move the cities into you because they want to keep us all close together, right? Easy, uh, Easier to control, I'm sure, is part of it. Go ahead. Yeah, I just did a, a lengthy talk on uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski's first book from 1970, Between Two Ages. And in that book, he discusses the studies that have been done for a long time about what happens in cosmopolitan industrial societies. So what happens is that people will move there thinking they're going to make money and, you know, enjoy the city life and all that. But what it actually does is that it breaks down and destroys the individual, almost kind of like a boot camp in a way. And uh, it, it removes people from their organic connection to the land to organic living all that kind of stuff that's actually been studied and they know that they can move people into giant metropolitan areas 
as a form of social engineering. So you're absolutely right that uh, if they can't get people into those areas, then the UN will come to your area. So interesting, man. You know, I'm also curious too, because we can talk about the symbols, of course, all day long. And I know that, and that's the beauty about you, Jay, really. And this is another thing that I've really liked about everything I've seen from you is you're all over the place. You know a little, a little bit and a lot of bit about a lot of things. And I think that's awesome, man. And I always like to ask people as far as looking around at the world today, uh, with all the stuff with Hillary and Clinton and, uh, and uh, Trump and all that, and all the all the weird stuff happening with Trump and all this too. You know, there's this whole beheading thing we're seeing all over the place. Uh, we're seeing, and you know, I know like like me, I know you're not really a part of that false left right paradigm, but it is interesting to watch. And what I feel like I'm seeing is that I mean, I've been talking about the coming civil war for a few years as well. I'm not trying mm-hmm. to be all you know, it, it's it's you know, it's here. Not trying to be Alex Jones ish, you mm-hmm. know, about it, but just warn them that I'm seeing these patterns and I see what they're trying to do. And a lot of us have been talking about it. And now Trump to me is just kind of like without probably meaning to be, or maybe he is, I don't know, but he's the figurehead of this. We've seen a as clear divided line right now. Now you've got the crazy liberal fascists using weapons and stuff. You know, it used to be the liberals we thought were the, the pacifists and not anymore. You know, so we see this really, really coming and happening. What are your thoughts on this whole civil war thing and how Trump plays in and some of this stuff? Yeah, I was kind of fooled for a little while with Trump. I, I, I read a whole bunch of the CFR and the big think tank papers that were written against Trump. And that made me think, well, if all of these giant globalist entities are like <laughs> madly against Trump, there's got to be something good going on there. And maybe there is still some degree to which he represents some faction that the bigger dominant elite doesn't like. I don't know, but uh, he certainly caved pretty quick on a lot of the issues that I thought were important, uh, like foreign policy and, and not having all this, uh, you know, regime change and exporting all this destructive uh, ideology that we tend to do uh he came pretty quick on all that and um so i i kind of lost the interest in the the possibilities i mean i was skeptical i wasn't ever like certain that he would like save things i don't believe in any political savior but i had optimism for for me too yeah me too uh, first time in a long time i mean i I haven't been a part of this for years even in the military i mean i Mm -hmm had to vote back then but when i got out i think that's the last time i ever voted i just haven't cared you know about any of these people really but yeah. but yeah i'm with you man there for a little while i was on the trump train choo choo there for about a month or so but without vocalizing it too much out there but i was i had hopes because i mean you know uh no matter how wicked a person is or how much money i mean i think that you know i believe god can use anybody for anything so he may use a, a wicked person he has in the past right so i looked at that angle of it you're right now it's just I don't know, man. Uh, like I said, there's so much programming, and I've never seen Hollywood be so outright vicious. I mean, they did a lot towards Bush, but mm-hmm. I mean, they're just straight up. You know, they're shooting him in videos and stuff. I mean, so yeah, think no, we're being, we're being set up for, uh, what do you think uh, we might be getting set up for here? Either they do want to spark uh, social, civil coup and unrest, and we really are seeing the outplay of those domestic operation. I just did a video yesterday on um, full spectrum dominance in the color revolution model, which is the CIA's longtime method of using the Rand Corporation research on how to achieve nonviolent coup and regime change in other, co- in other countries. So we've seen a whole bunch of these, like if you remember from the 90s, there was the Free Tibet movement. That was actually a CIA color revolution that was sponsored by their asset, the Dalai Lama, to try to get a regime change uh, as a geopolitical strategy for that region. It's called the Saffron Revolution, and it continues even now. Uh, Very interesting. Yeah, the, uh, the color revolution in Georgia was the Rose Revolution. The color revolution in the Ukraine was the Orange Revolution. These are all machinations of a guy named Jean Sharp, uh, from the Albert Einstein Institute, who uh, is using this Rand Corporation research from back in the 60s on how to, I'm not joking, study swarming, the swarming <laughs> of bees, and to model that in how you can organize students, revolutionaries, blah, 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 to do like mob protests, uh, uh, like mobs on the spot type stuff. And you agitate through that, through the technique of agitation prop, agitprop, which is an old Soviet technique of uh, 
stoking tensions. So basically all of that's been studied. And by the way, that actually ties into the Phoenix program, believe it or not. Interesting. Yeah, because uh, part of what they wanted to do was destabilize the Viet Cong. Uh, and so they were doing these terror operations through these psychos, right, as part of destabilization. So it's all about destroying infrastructure and existing social order through exacerbation of tensions and key points in the existing structure. So if you wow. if you can knock those out, then it, re it then you can achieve a change in the mass consciousness and get a new leader, somebody more amenable to the CIA, basically. Uh, and that's what we've seen in all of these countries. That is the model. Uh, now, they will at times send troops and invade if they need to, but the, what Brzezinski really pioneered with soft power was this approach of trying to topple leaders, not through necessarily a Manchurian candidate, you know, sniping them from a tower, you know, Scarlett Johansson or Mila Jovovich up on a tower sniping <laughs> somebody, but but rather get a whole bunch of people who are dupes into some pseudo-revolutionary movement through some NGO funded by Soros, right, to get everybody mad enough that the government has to capitulate and, you know, allow some new CIA puppet or something. So that model is exactly what's being used in the U.S. through the mainstream media to agitate to try to get everybody stoked up to get to, to exacerbate every single tension possible, religious, racial, whatever, you name it, to try to get a, a, a boiling point. And do they really want a civil war? I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't be surprised. I don't think they need a civil war because I see it, you know, as kind of already under control. Uh, but I wouldn't put it if, if they would do 9-11, they, I don't put anything past them. Yeah. You know, you're making me think of it's really it's, the most shocking video evidence I've ever seen of an MK Ultra breakdown, and that was Jason Russell from Coney 2012. Uh, <laughs> you remember that? I'm and too, in yeah. fact, there was an extended video that they cut because TMZ put that info out one time. I saw it on TMZ. Later, I did some digging. There was video where after he's spazzing out, you actually see a guy come out of the bushes. It was talking to him in his ear the whole time, and he has like bunny ears on and some weird mm -hmm. suit, and he grabs him and runs off with him. But huh. I mean, it, even. It, Symbolism. If you look at the Coney 2012 poster, that's a hidden Baphomet on his forehead. Oh. You know, I mean, there's so many. So what What do you know about Coney 12? What do you think? What were they trying to get over there for? Do you know? Yeah, I do. Uh, actually, this goes back to the 90s when there was the early 90s. There was a plan to uh, expand U.S. influence and bases in Africa. Uh, and this is called AFRICOM. Now, you can go to the AFRICOM website and it's all public. So this is not a conspiracy theory. They talked about back long time ago under bush how do we expand into africom or into africa well we're going to set up this whole new military program africom so guess what i'm going to show i'm going to lay out the whole secret of how all this works what do you think they came up with as the justification to expand africom <laughs> who knows bad guys new bad guys right Just how many and this is the same model every single time the bin Laden, he's the justification for operations in Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Middle East. Now, nowadays, right? He used to be the friend, right? Back in the night in 1979, he was our, our ally. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, Kim Jong Un, Kim Jong Il, they're the justification for bases up in that region, right? Castro, he's the justification for bases down in that region, right? Latin South America. Exact same thing. Coney is just a completely created warlord figure. The CIA's already had deals with warlords. Charles Taylor was a warlord who worked for the CIA. So this is, it's just a total scam. And we don't even know if this dude's alive. Yeah. This dude could have been like Bin Laden. He could have been dead 10 years ago. But they just put out, a, <laughs> put out a poster and put out some goofy, you know, cheesy YouTube video from who knows when uh, of uh, like a sweaty black dude with a, you know, an yeah. Uzi. Uh, our machine gun and we're and everybody just believes oh yeah we got to go down there and save the the child soldiers from coney right the, the the oh yeah yeah the the child stuff is always a big always the kids. war propaganda thing anytime you're anytime the mainstream media is putting out something about the children you can know 99999% sure that that's 
BS and that sucks. <laughs> sure. Yeah, just remember the Jessica Lynch thing that they put the babies in the incubators uh, and they threw them out on the floor. So we went <laughs> yeah. after we went after Saddam because Saddam was was literally walking up and picking up a baby and throwing him on the floor. That's what Saddam was. <laughs> Saddam threw babies. They totally played the baby card. They did that with Syria too, with this uh, Amran, this boy, the the dusty boy, and then this other uh, refugee who supposedly floated up on on the sea, on the seashore, dead. And I think that's all fake. It's it's just uh, propaganda yeah. to make you feel bad. Like, oh, well, America's going to go save you know save us from Coney. Then what you realize <laughs> is that what what does Africa have? Giant deposits of uh, rare earth minerals. Wow, that's really interesting, man. So yeah, you can start drawing the uh, connections. Follow the money, as they say, right? Um, you know, here's a here's a fun one for you. And I've been wanting to compile a video on it, but I'm still waiting for more footage because I know something else is going to come out of it. But Dennis Rodman and Kim Jong Un's bizarre mm -hmm. relationship. What do you think about that? Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I did a 10 minute video on um, uh, North Korea, which was based on an article I wrote a couple of years ago. That's most people will agree with the thesis. I'm not saying I'm 100% right. It's just my thesis. And I don't think that it's what it's presented as. Now, I'm not saying that Kim Jong-un isn't a bad dude. or, But I view these communist dictator guys like mobsters that are allowed to be in certain regions to justify the U.S. foreign policy and military base presence. That's yes. what I think it is. I'm with you on that. That's good. Yeah. And yeah, that's, uh, it's just one I've, I've been following for a while because they've done that before. It was interesting. And I put this in the video a while back, but even when Julian Assange was still, I can't remember which country he was in, but he was trapped up in a room somewhere. So they told us, and mm -hmm. uh, he had two visitors and they were both, uh, you know, basically MK ultra puppets. One was uh, lady Gaga and she went there dressed as a witch <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> with a witch hat on even. And then they sent Pamela uh, Lee Anderson out there as well. So, you yes, know, I uh, I think that these uh, these these a lot of these pop stars are probably like the A-listers. Quite a few of them are probably CIA, like Ben Affleck, uh, Jennifer Garner. I mean, they've even worked for the CIA openly. I'm glad you brought that up because I did a video on the KJ channel years ago questioning mm -hmm. could Ben Affleck and Matt Damon be involved with the CIA because oh, yeah. uh, Matt Damon did that movie about uh, Freemason rituals and being in the CIA. You know, so what what are your thoughts on some of those guys? Yeah, Good Shepherd is based uh, directly on the Skull and Bones initiation uh, and vetting process to pick out the future spooks, right? I mean, I think everybody's in the conspiracy world is familiar with Skull and Bones now. We all know that, and we know that's where a lot of CIA WASP elite uh, Eastern Coast establishment come from. Uh, and uh, yes, I, I remember right around that time, uh, I was still an undergrad when that movie came out, that's when I was really starting to notice a lot of the Hollywood CIA tie-ins. And that was totally new to me. Like I knew that, oh, there's, you know, maybe a cultist in Hollywood. There's Masons, you know, Satanists. But I did not ever conceive of how intimately tied together the CIA and these different intelligence apparatuses, uh, apparatchiks are to Hollywood. And it's like, they're, they're like, flip sides of the same coin, man. It's crazy. And yeah, that's, a, that's, yeah. a, that's actually a big part of my book is that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. And, and that's why I'm trying to dance gingerly. I definitely know a lot of your material and I, you know, that's why I know we want to, I mean, and it's already been so amazing. Everything we're talking about is great. And we do want people to check out your book. We do want people to check out more of your work because it's, it's totally important. And uh, like I said, we, I'm, I'm glad that you're, you still, are you comfortable? You go with hanging out for a little bit and chatting? Yeah. Somewhere? Well, I mean, you know, Ben Affleck went on the guardian and said the ho Hollywood's full of CIA. That's interesting. You know, and, and I think about sometimes, cause when I started looking into this, I was like, I wonder how they're approached. But then the deal is that then we get into the idea of the narcissist, you know, the sociopaths and a lot of these celebrities are that, you know, on some level or another. So it's probably a big, you know, boost to their ego to get approached by the government. Right. And to start having those tie-ins, there's a video. You know, There's a movie on that. Oh, is it, what is it? Have you seen Ghost Rider? Oh, you, I, I saw that. Is that the Nicolas Cage one? That can't be the same thing. No, <laughs> no, no, not Nick Cage. No, not Nick. <laughs> KJ, you're driving me crazy. No, um, 
Ghost Writer with a T. It's a Roman Polanski movie that has Ewan McGregor in it. And Ewan McGregor plays a writer who is tasked with writing the biography of a, a Tony Blair character. So the Pierce Brosnan plays this Tony Blair stand-in character. And here's the fascinating point about that movie. I won't spoil it. It's a, it's a, it's a little slow, but it's actually an insightful film if you haven't seen it for all the stuff we're talking about. Uh, the Ewan McGregor character is trying to write this biography, and he's realizing that most of what he's told by the pseudo Tony Blair guy is BS. But he wants to actually write a real biography. So what he does is like he goes and like digs into this dude's background, and he finds out that he was an actor in at Oxford and was recruited by the CIA, right? And that's the avenue by which he got into being prime minister. Wow, that's very interesting. But it wouldn't have happened if he'd not been recruited as a successful actor at Oxford. Now, I don't. I think I've read that Tony Blair was into acting at Oxford. Uh, I don't know for certain if the movies... I'm not sure. I think I've read that in the BBC a long time ago. I, but anyway, point being is that you're seeing all the time in movies these kinds of things that tell you how it happens, right? So just like Good Shepherd, college. College is where older spooks are tasked with talent spotting. We th just think about how it happens in sports. Right. I mean, and probably fraternities and sororities as well. Right. Oh, I yeah, imagine totally. they come up out of there. The whole fraternity model is the model of the secret society slash intelligence agency. Intelligence yeah, agency. Sure. It, yeah. It's baby steps into a oaths of secrecy and all that, isn't it? Yeah. So just like when, you know, you're, uh, I remember when I was uh, in high school, there would be talent scouts that would show up these weird sketchy looking dudes at the basketball team, right? Like <laughs> watching to see who the next, you know, possible college basketball dude might be. Not, not me. I was like, I wasn't that good, but I could just shoot three pointers, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, looking for the real talent. And so I'm saying it's no different in the subject of like looking for talented actors, looking for talented, um, you know, PR people, talented, uh, potential spies. And that's why right. Interesting. for so long, you can go all the way back to a whole host of Hollywood people who were directly tapped for intelligence work. Cary Grant, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, there's a whole like long list of them. Well, you know, Arbuckle. there's also that. Greta Garbo. I'm sorry. Oh, Fatty Arbuckle. That's a really interesting one, too. What do you know about him? Uh, I remember Kenneth. Anger has a chapter, I think, or a section where he talks about him, but I don't, does he have an intelligence connection? I didn't know that. No, I, I thought you'd mentioned Fatty, and I, I thought maybe you knew something about him. I wasn't sure, but I was going to throw this out there, because now you're making me think about that that connection between a lot of, it, 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 many people have talked about this in the past, and there's speculation, but I wonder if you know anything about it. Kind of the CDE list actresses wind up uh, going out to Saudi Arabia a lot and partying with some of these people. Have you heard about some of this stuff? I remember uh, that, uh, what's her name? Dolly Parton has this story she used to tell that she slept with a sheik for like $10,000 or something. Yes. So apparently there's a whole subculture of that. Yeah. And I need, I need to dig more into that as well. It's very there interesting. There was uh, one of those e-documentaries. Uh, I think Mark Dice is in it. Uh, Secret, Society, Secret Societies of Hollywood. This is the only thing I've ever seen touch on this is uh, one section of that documentary talks about the sex side of Hollywood where, yes, the some of the BC list people will go and do that because it's like one weekend, you know, fifty hundred thousand mm dollars Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, that's, that's interesting, man. I want to jump back also. also for, to, for, go ahead. For more uh, backup of that thesis, there are reports. Uh, Con Film Festival. The every year at the Con Film Festival, the there are like fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollar prostitutes that show up there, 
and this is like a known thing it's not even hidden <laughs> so just look look up the <laughs> prostitutes at con film festival and you'll be surprised at how open and you know even kind of i think this these girls are more of the models like not necessarily they could be a-listers i don't know but more of the you know the, the heidi klum type i'm not saying heidi klum i'm just saying the supermodel yeah costume. i know like the aging su aging supermodels oh, yeah. you know who are and by the way aging supermodel is like upper 20s <laughs> like yeah, yeah, 28 right, right. you know uh you know they right. they will actually uh be escorts uh you know at con film festival well that could mean that could uh explain why i think it's naomi campbell uh her husband has uh, bought her, her an island and the above shot view of it is the all-seeing eye i don't know if you heard of that or not but that's interesting yes. so that could be one of those things. i have seen that and um there's a whole bunch of weird things like that, you know, and, and we think of Nicolas Cage's tomb as a giant pyramid. I did a lot of stuff on, on Nicolas Cage in a video way back, and uh, when I worked out in Hollywood, I actually met a guy that was his personal chef for many years. Oh, wow. And Yeah, he had a lot of stories, but I wasn't necessarily awake to all this stuff at the time, so I wasn't asking him the questions I, I would have asked now, but, uh, but he seems like an interesting guy, but I've looked into him, you know, since even his son, you know, is really deep into some satanic type stuff. He's an artist, and uh, Nicholas Cage has talked a lot about black magic, and he lives mm -hmm. in Louisiana, I think, still. So, you have anything on Nicholas Cage? I know you do an awesome impression of him. Anything connected with uh, his witchcraft or anything like this? What do you think about Nicholas Cage? Not beyond the kind of stuff that you talked about. I've seen him many times in interviews talk about being interested in uh, Jacob Boehm, which was a Germanic, uh, Prussia, or a, a like a, a Prague based, uh, late medieval mystic who talked a lot about Neoplatonism. And I've seen him talk about the Theologica Germanica, which was a, an esoteric mystic text that influenced Martin Luther. Um, that's true, by the way. You can look it up, I'm not making that up. Um, I've seen him talk about that kind of stuff that's all i've ever been able to verify because i've heard him actually mention it in, in a lot of interviews um his son was into like some really death metal -y stuff and then i think last year he rebranded himself totally like he got rid of that and he's just this normal looking dude now oh okay right on which is which is interesting um but other than that i you know i don't really know anything personal about nicholas cage other than that you know he's the relative of the coppolas and Sophia Coppola yeah. and, and all well, that. Yeah, and, and, and certainly Francis Ford Coppola has made some pretty important films that are revelatory like The Godfather. Well, I want to get into that in a moment. I also feel like I want to ask you this because I don't know. Uh, I know you've been around a lot. You've done a lot of, uh, of uh, public speaking and things like this, and you've got a name out there, which is awesome. You've been around a bit. Uh, have have you ever met any celebrities that that said, "Hey, uh, you know, you're onto something," or "I like what you're doing," or have you ever heard from anybody like that? I'm curious. Uh, well, I got to be buddies with Sean Stone, um, so I, don't, I mean, we're not like best friends. I don't like I don't call up Sean, either, but but uh, he's had me on his show a couple times, and I flew out to be on his Gaia show, Buzzsaw, uh, about th uh, towards the end of last year. Okay, I was. That's interesting. Go ahead. And actually, you know, I've seen again. You know, in these conspiracy communities, we have to be careful. You have to really wade carefully because some people are just see an image of something and go cuckoo with it. And he did mm -hmm. a a movie a while back, and I saw the trailer. And then underneath, I just comment after comment. He sold out to the Illuminati. He's one of them. You know, he's. I mean, what's your experience with Sean Stone? Because he's another one that uh, definitely wide awake and has uh, had a lot of really interesting experiences. And uh, what are your thoughts there? And how'd that go? What do you think? I think Sean's a brilliant dude. I mean, we, we got to hang out one night, uh, the night before the show and it was me and him and some of the other guests that he had on that, that week. And, uh, he's super sharp, uh, very well read, very well researched. In fact, his book came out from same publisher as mine at the same time. So, uh, I mean, it was weird because he wrote a book on geopolitics and he's from, <laughs> Hollywood and then I wrote my book on Hollywood and a lot of my <laughs> articles are geo so it was a really weird thing and we didn't coordinate that or anything. I, I didn't meet him until a couple of years ago when he had me on but um, I, I don't get the impression that Sean is a bad guy at all I think he's a, a genuine guy he's very like I said very sharp 
Um, he's actually really tall, dude, too. Like you think that you have this impression that a lot of Hollywood people are going to be short, like Tom Cruise or something. Sean Stone's like seven feet, <laughs> not seven, but he's like a really <laughs> tall dude. And uh, I, I mean, he was just very laid back, very cool. Nobody was like offering any kind of secret society. Yeah, hey, come, come to this party, man. Throw on this mask, man. Nah, we were time. we were at the, we were all at the same uh, sports bar restaurant, which was at the hotel that we stayed at to be on the show. Oh, so, okay. That's cool. <laughs> so we were just sitting at that bar and had had a couple beers, and that was about it. But we talked for about two hours. But he did have some really cool stories about like ritual stuff, uh, cult ritual murders in the history of Hollywood, some that I'd never heard of. Um, I don't remember what they were off the top of my head, but, um, and yeah, he had, he had some really interesting stories about Oliver Stone who just did this really Putin excellent diaries Putin interview. Yeah. So, so I have nothing but positive things to say for Sean Stone. I think he's a genuine dude. Now he might have some interests like Islamic theology that, you know, I'm not particularly that interested in that. Um, but you know, that's, that's Sean's thing. I don't, you know, I don't judge. Him. Yeah. Did he ever mention anything about, uh, like you, you did mention his father and if anybody's in the know with some of these, uh, Hollywood occultists and whatnot, I, I'm sure he, he knows what's going on, which begs the question, you know, how many of these people can have a career still out there and be pretty big and not have to go through the rituals, not have to go to the lodge and all this, you know, I wonder. I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I think most of I appreciate Oliver Stone as a filmmaker. I think he makes really good films, generally speaking. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the Snowden movie, but that's because my own personal theories about what the whole Snowden thing is. And this is kind of similar to what we were talking about earlier with Assange and that stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't really... Uh, I have uh, a very agnostic view of JFK. The movie, I think, is great. Um, what exactly happened to the in the JFK thing? I think it's so buried in mountains of disinfo and labyrinths that I don't. How will we ever like, get to the bottom? Of yeah. That? I mean, I think I think it's obviously not what we're told. Like, but but that's the problem is that in so many of these big conspiracy things, after a while, it's like you could spend a whole decade researching JFK. And I mean, are you ever going to get to the bottom of this? There's such a conspiracy mill about it, you know, that just churns out new crap all the time. Yeah. And I, so I just, I don't really have, but I think that, he, that Oliver Stone does make excellent movies. I think he's made some of the best movies, I think. Well, you reminded me of something. There's something I was going to tell you earlier and I just, we jumped off on another subject, but it has to do with Bush or yeah, Bush senior, George Bush senior, you know, he was the CIA during the JFK assassination. I believe he's the one that made the first phone call, they say. But what I was going to tell you earlier is there's a video you can find online on YouTube. That's why I was saying I've been on here so long. I remember some of these random weird videos that disappear, so I've tried to download and keep them as many you know, the yeah. weird ones I can find. But this is one of uh, Bush Sr. with Terry Hatcher. Uh, she's an actress from Desperate Housewives. Hmm. And they're at the car. He's got three Secret Service standing around him. And they're hugging and he pats her butt as she walks off. You know, it's hmm. like clearly they have a very hmm. close relationship. I don't know if you've seen that one or not. No, that's a new one to me. Um, I haven't seen that. And that was uh, that connection with the, with the government and Hollywood again, too, you know? Yeah, I do. I go into that a lot in the book. There's a whole chapter where I deal with... Um, well, not just my book, but there's actually other books that have been written just on the connection of like the Pentagon to Hollywood. There's a great one called Operation Hollywood uh, that if you're a movie, if you're not a movie buff, you'll find that book boring. But if you're like a super movie geek, you definitely want to read Operation Hollywood because they actually go into all of these movies that you wouldn't ever expect have direct Pentagon influence and funding. Are and, there any that you can mention off the top sure, of your head yeah, you're thinking? Uh, uh, like, for example... If you go back to the 80s, do you remember the comedy Stripes? Loved it. Stripes is a recruitment film. <laughs> I see that now. Interesting. If you watch at the end of the credits, it actually says, like, credit, thanks to Department of Defense. <laughs> and so that, oh, wow. that was like 1981 or two. That was still Cold War. And so the whole message of that movie was, if you're Bill Murray and John Candy and, and you're Ivan Reitman and you're like, losers and driving a cab and you look you can't do anything with your life you join the military and then i mean it's i understand it's a comedy that's but, right but 
by the end of the film, they're on the cover of Time magazines as heroes saving us from the Soviets. And that's great because you're right. The message basically is join the military, hook up with some hot chicks. You're going to party and do some drugs here and there. And, you know, it's going to be a blast. And you're going to go kill We're the enemy. We're going to make a hero out of it. Yeah. Now, I remember watching that movie because I, I, I like 80s yeah. and 80s comedies and all that. But I remember thinking that's probably a recruitment film. And then when I read Operation Hollywood, you bet. Absolutely. So uh, there's a whole bunch of those. Uh, especially 80s stuff, Top Gun, Navy SEALs. Uh, those are 80s recruitment films that were, had a lot of Reagan funding. Reagan would allocate money just specifically during his rebuilding of America. Red Dawn. Huh? Oh, yeah. Totally, that's a totally, totally propaganda movie. Um, the, the, every time I think about Red Dawn, I think about Patrick Swayze crying in his nostrils like just going like, <laughs> like he's he's in that in, in fema camp and his nostrils are he's like brawl, he balls for like a minute straight um yeah operation hollywood mentions probably 50 movies man there's like it, it just blow it'll blow your mind because it's all this stuff you don't even think about like since you're a movie geek too let me do a random jump off because uh quickly red dawn reminds me of powers booth who was in the movie who I always liked, you know, is one of those actors like Gene Hackman. When I was a kid, mm -hmm. I always looked up to these guys. Did you ever see, and this is still one of my top 10 favorite films of all time, and I feel like no one knows what it is. It stars Powers Booth, and it was called Southern Comfort. Have you ever seen that? I haven't. It's brilliant. It's him and a couple other reservists. They're down in the bayou, you know, Cajun country, and they wound up getting attacked by a bunch of Cajuns out there. And uh, all these guys have are guns with uh, blanks. So they have to fight for their lives out in Cajun country against these mad Cajuns. And it's one of the best movies as far as action I've, I've ever seen. If you guys haven't seen it, check it out. Random jump off. Sorry. Uh, no, that's cool. I mean, I, I always write down uh, new suggestions here because there's always, you know, new, new films you haven't seen, which is interesting because uh, like recently I was just watching this wacko uh, horror movie called The Void. Did you see that? Wow, that blew my mind because you, like you, I, I'm guessing you're probably a fan of, of like The Thing and uh, Carpenter. You oh, I love fan John Carpenter. Carpenter. Yeah, Me I'm, too, uh, I grew up on them. So yeah, it reminded me of a John Carpenter. And The Void, go ahead and tell the people that. That's another one, folks, if you want to see symbolism and meanings. Oh boy, but go ahead. Yeah, um, I have, I think three or four John Carpenter analyses. And, and my goal is eventually to have like the whole Carpenter canon have a, have a written analyses of every one of those. But cool. Um, this is very influenced by uh, John Carpenter. And it, it seems to have a lot of influence from like Clive Barker type stuff too. And maybe even Freddie and, you know, the, the goofy eighties uh, nightmare on Elm street type type horror. But this is uh it's a, it all takes place basically inside of this hospital. And you think that it's just a cult that's surrounded this hospital and kind of acting ominously and weird and creeping everybody out inside. And then all this weird stuff starts happening and people start kind of encountering more or less John Carpenter-esque <laughs> blobs, blobs of mutant goo that are growing arms. And, and anyway, so it turns out that there's this doctor who was, I'm not going to spoil the movie, but there's a doctor who was getting really into ritual magic and experimenting on people and trying to bring back a dead daughter or something like that. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, so it's about him kind of opening this portal to the abyss or the void, which is, you know, a real biblical slash occult thing. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Very, very John Carpenter. I, I didn't think it was a great movie, but it was very revealing in many ways, especially when Definitely. it comes to esoteric Hollywood. Yeah, man. I mean, another fun fact, when I worked out there, I had an agent for my writing and I had a horror film called tonight. He walks and I actually had meetings and I got to go to Tranka's films. It was called at the time which is the company that's done all the Halloween films. And they put me in an office when I was waiting by myself right huh. next to the original Michael Myers mask. I was loving it. <laughs> it Never sold anything, but it was just kind of cool. But yeah, man, uh, John Carpenter's another one of those guys that'd be great to meet and talk with. Uh, when I, when I went to film school, one of his chief composers 
was uh, our one of our guys that taught us how to compose music and film and stuff like this. So he had a lot of really cool stories about John mm. Carpenter as well, who sounds like he legitimately, I mean, really believed in a lot of the stuff. He seems like he had a lot of knowledge and knew what was going on. And that's why, you know, I, I get people write me sometimes and they're like, you know, is everybody in Hollywood uh, evil doing this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, man, there's, I believe there's real messengers out there that are good people mm. that made it and that are warning the public, like Black Mirror to me, that whole series on the BBC. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of them. What do you think about that? Yeah, I like Black Mirror. It was, uh, it is pretty revealing, pretty dark too. Um, and I would venture to, to say that I agree. I, I don't think everybody's obviously not everybody's evil. Um, that's, that's nonsense. Uh, and, and the, the memes that are put out to make you feel like everybody's bad. That's demoralizing. I think that's put out maybe on purpose. Like for example, yeah. I've, I have this, this, the view and I've had it for a long time that 1984 is actually a novel that's intended to demoralize that whole story because it's nihilistic. The whole point of it, the end of it is there's no hope for you to fight against the new world order. <laughs> that's the <laughs> yeah, point of right. the book, right? A boot stamping on Winston's face for all eternity. And then when you look at the history of George, uh, Eric Blair, George Orwell, um, you know, he's had, has all these intelligence ties. So I tend to think that was probably the book itself is actually a psyop. I think it's intended to make you feel pessimistic. There's no hope. Uh, Brave New World, same thing. It ends nihilistically. Huxley even says it's, it's a plan. It's not a novel. So, wow. so I don't think that we should buy into the idea of everybody being evil because that's actually a tactic to make you give up. Oh, well, Absolutely. everybody's evil. There's, you know, there's no point. So, um, and also remember that people are people like we, I have, I've had a journey in my life where I've changed my views and I don't believe everything that I believed when I was 25. Um, I've changed my mind. People change their mind. They're not all being controlled. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people are, but the way that a lot of the control happens is just through money. It's like, if you don't go along, you're not going to get the big deals you know what i mean mm -hmm. that's yeah, the absolutely. main that's the main means of control i'm not saying there's not other means of blackmail or sex parties uh, i mean all that stuff is true but the main way simplest way easiest way is to just control people with money like you're not going to get you know this movie deal if you don't <laughs> you know agree to i don't know like the transgender agenda or whatever it may be um that that's really what's going on so you know yeah. not everybody is is literally being told what they have to say they're not all mind control puppets and you know we see this quite often where people say things out of hollywood that are you know taboo they're you're not supposed to say that you know what i mean and they even put it in some of their films i mean you know and it just keeps perpetuating this idea like starry eyes did you ever see starry I did. eyes I did see starry eyes yeah it reminded and, uh, me of uh, david lynch in quite a, quite a few so. aspects yeah and there's a new movie coming out. I saw the trailer a few days ago called American Satan, which is all about a rock band in Hollywood literally doing deals with the Illuminati. And they're talking about it in the trailers. So, huh. you know, now, of course, that also could be a part of the I mean, you know, again, we say it's all being revealed. And uh, seven, eight years ago when I was looking at all this, you know, I mean, there wasn't a lot of people talking about the Illuminati. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not saying it was me. It was a lot of people. But now you just look at it and it's, you know, it's all over the place. They had it in a car commercial a while back. Some guy asking Siri on his computer what the Illuminati was in front of his daughter, you know, so they've they've mainstreamed it. And of course, you were talking earlier about uh, the Mel Gibson movie Conspiracy Theory yeah. the theorist. And then, you know, we got uh, all these like Pizza Hut's been making commercials on it, progressive uh, insurance. Uh, you know, how the conspiracy theorist, the kook, you know, so it's all, it's like the system's having to fight it back. There's such an awakening happening. And this is why we see mainstream media falling away. Of course, that's why the fake news narrative came up. And they're trying to attack YouTube and anybody individual out there and, and off the uh, the mainstream narrative. And mm -hmm. it's a fascinating time we're in, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, that's what, just to bring it back to my book, what I tried to do was take the big directors, I did 80 pages on Kubrick. Uh, then I did a bunch on Spielberg and the alien demon mythos. And then AI ties in how the AI artificial intelligence stuff ties into the Spielberg movies and the Philip K. Dick stories. And then I did a, a section on um, 
80s fantasy and stuff that was for our generation when we were growing up, like Labyrinth, Dark Crystal, those kinds of Jim Henson movies. Um, and then I did a section on Bond and Hitchcock and how much is revealed in espionage movies, spy movies. And then the last section is uh, David Lynch movies and Twin Peaks and then CIA in Hollywood. So the whole the book the book is basically just presenting all of this and saying it's not all bad and it's not all good. Here's my attempt <laughs> at an here's my attempt at an objective analysis of when Stanley Kubrick might be telling us some good stuff and for a reason. Here's where somebody else might be trying to mind control us. You know what I mean? So I try uh, to be, yeah. I try to be fair in the book and present all of the big, well, the, the main big directors that I focused on, their stories and what is not just the bad, but the good that we can see in these stories. Because everybody's going to see movies. Everybody loves movies. Most people, 99%. And people are going to keep going and seeing movies. They're, they're not going away anytime soon. So we might as well find uh, glasses that we can wear, you know, through which to interpret movies. Yeah, I really appreciate that, that you're taking such a reasonable approach to these wild subjects. We need more minds like that. It's a good thing. And and I have to ask, I was going to ask this earlier, speaking of AI and Steven Spielberg, mm -hmm. uh, of course, there's the Kubrick connection. So without giving away too much, um, uh, anything you want to cover about that whole scenario was very strange. You know, the AI film, Kubrick started it right. Then after he died, I guess Spielberg took over and changed the ending. I mean, you, what do you know about, about that? Well, uh, Jay Wiedner um, and Jay and I have, we've, uh, we just finished filming 17 epi episodes of a TV show for, uh, for Gaia TV. So oh, cool. one, of, cool. one of the whole, one of the episodes is actually AI. So we, which was interesting because a lot of the times in the episodes that we did, most of the show was roughly based on what I wrote in the book, but um, in that episode, we kind of had some back and forth. Most of the time we agreed, but in that one, he has an interesting theory that Kubrick was going to reveal more about the ever present Kubrick theory of like human trafficking and underage sex stuff amongst the elite. Because right. that's in The Shining, that's in um, Lolita, that's in Barry Lyndon. That's in several Kubrick films. Um, it's in Eyes Wide Shut. Uh, so his theory was that Kubrick was also continuing that motif, that point in AI with the David character. But that when but but Spielberg changed the ending. Now I don't know if that's true. That's just Jay Wiener's thesis. Um, my thesis on it is that it's a promotion of transhumanism. So I read it as I called it in my book a transhumanist fairy tale. So the, the storyline is actually trying to, to give a mythical presentation of the Pinocchio story to show that the bots are actually better than the humans. So it, it dehumanizes man and it humanizes the bots and makes them superior, morally superior. That's the whole point of the David character. Mm -hmm. and, then it, and then it becomes this kind of mythology of of a new creation of a new Adam. There's a lot of Edenic imagery from the garden of Eden in that movie. And David becomes the, the progenitor of a completely new race of superior, yes. superior transhumanist beings that we mistake as aliens. A lot of people, yes. watch that, a lot of people watch that movie and thought, Oh, here's Spielberg with another alien movie. No, they're not aliens. They're robots. And that is amazing because since that movie came out, I mean, I cover this subject in a lot of videos just by the news articles themselves. And it's so in our face now. I'm seeing VR technology commercials all the time. And, and uh, the sex robots are here. You know, they're even mm -hmm. looking at building cafes in England for sex robots and you know, for humans. Um, and yeah. I look at it like the post-human world they're creating now. I've talked about this in other videos that they're literally replacing us already with the robots. Like they're getting ready. It almost feels like for some mass extinction, I feel sometimes. Uh, mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Makes me think of another movie. Did you see Joss Whedon's uh, Firefly series? I used to love that show. Yeah. yeah, I even saw the movie. Yeah, yeah, me too. Well, I was thinking of the movie because the movie has, uh, I forget that actress's name, but she's the uh, mind control assassin. So, right. she, so it actually references MK Ultra, 
which by the way, Joss Whedon puts in a lot of movies and shows that he has, but, but, um, Doll that house, it, yeah. it also has the sex bots are a big part of that. Well, not a big part, but the guy who's kind of running the transmissions for the galaxy, he's got, a, he's got these sex bots. And then X Machina was a big sex plot, the sex bot plot, <laughs> the sex bot plot. <laughs> uh, so I did a big long analysis of X Machina. If you, if you saw that, um, which I would say, check out because that's very revelatory in terms of exactly what you're talking about with the, you know, like, depopulation in relationship to the ai yes which is weird uh, that's weird you brought that up because this morning i was reading uh that windows is working on this very strange approach to ai and quantum computing that uses crystals i'm not joking by the way uh and and it's weird because it's tied into like neoplatonism which is something i've dealt with a lot at my at my site so it's almost like they really are kind of using these ancient mythologies and philosophies tied into their AI new God approach. It's very strange. That is. And I'm sure you've looked at Westworld. What are your thoughts mm-hmm. on that, man? That's a, a real mind blower as well. Yeah, I did analysis of Westworld. And um, if our <clears throat> if our TV show does well, there will be a second season. We've already got, I think, five or six episodes planned. Oh, cool, one, of those ep- one of those episodes will be dedicated to Westworld. Um, what I think is unique about Westworld, and I wasn't a huge fan of the new show. Honestly, I kind of figured it out pretty quick, and I didn't think it was – it kind of let me down, kind of a, a, a mm-hmm. anticlimactic thing because I was like, oh, okay, so, yeah, you know, Anthony Hopkins is a you know part of the, the yeah. bots and all that. It was kind of transparent, but um, – what I think is weird about it and how Michael Crichton was very, had a lot of foresight in his story is this whole idea of imaginary worlds. So I think what you mentioned with VR is that what they're going to do probably in the future is there's going to be some kind of combination of the Disneyland experience with VR and giant, theme parks that are all wow, that's be- interesting. yeah that's what i think they're going to do and i think that's why they're showing us this in westworld is that that's what is to come because what they want to do and by the way i think disney was 100 percent a total mind control government pentagon oh, thing yeah. from the get-go uh is they're going to use that model and they're going to expand that into like and, and you'll notice too because when i was a kid disneyland was like you know epcot and magic kingdom now Disneyland is like Harry Potter world and now there's Avatar world. And so they're going to use all these new mythologies and they're, they're going to bring them to life because they want us to be fully immersed in synthetic realities, just like the matrix. And that was the point of the matrix. Man, I know that's so fascinating. And you've probably seen some things on the black goo as well. Do you feel that plays any kind of role in, with programmable matter and any ways they may try to use that? Any thoughts on the black goo uh i'm not i don't think that it's any kind of alien thing i don't believe in aliens um so but i i'm aware of this theme and you know throughout a lot of science fiction you know it's in it's in the x-files it's in all kinds of shows um and it's definitely nanotech (coughs) excuse me so obviously that you know nanotechnology is real how far they can go with nanotech I, i don't know but I mean, I definitely think that that that's what they're working on. I do think there's a connection to geoengineering with nanotechnology. Uh, I'm not saying that we're all going to be sprayed in mind control per se yeah. with some look, I, I'm not trying to be apocalyptic and fear porn. Um, but I'm just saying what I've researched and what I can verify is that there does seem to be a, a connection between the companies that do nanotech and the geoengineering, what they're up to. I don't know. I think it mainly is weather modification. Um, I don't, so I don't know. I mean, I mean, there are, when you, when you watch Ray Kurzweil documentaries and all that kind of stuff, you'll see them talk about the idea of gray matter and black goo and the potentialities for nanotech. But you have to remember that a lot of those AI uh, transhumanist 
documentaries and books are also propaganda. So they actually want to try to convince you and sell you on the fact that, oh, the computers are going to become conscious. Mm -hmm. And so, so I tend to be skeptical when I see, you know, these Ray Kurzweil type documentaries. Not, I'm not <laughs> saying it's all wrong. I'm just saying I'm not immediately going to be, because I know that it's put out there to convince people that, oh, you're going to be like Scarlett Johansson and Lucy, and you're going to turn into a, you know, supercomputer and, you know, we'll just put you on our zip drive, you know, <laughs> which is all a bunch of nonsense. <laughs> yeah, I noticed uh, one of the last videos I saw of yours, I went through a few recently, was about the arrival. And I'm not sure how often you cover that topic because I cover it myself. It's the uh, predictive programming for the fake alien invasion mm -hmm. or perhaps some kind of a real, uh, I believe, false, uh, you know, like be a false flag. They'd think it's aliens, but it's actually perhaps demons or the locusts or something like that. But fallen angels, if you will. But what are your thoughts on this alien programming we're seeing? You want to get into some of that at all? Yeah, I found an actual academic document that proves it. Good. Uh, let me grab the book, actually. Okay, cool. And while you're doing that, I'll just talk to the people here real quick and see how the chat's doing. Uh, the last time I went, the only mod I had in there I saw was Games Exposed. I might be wrong, but I hope you're doing okay in there, Games. I know you're, they're probably keeping you busy. I don't know. But, uh, uh, you know, okay, Smalls is here. Good to see you. Anyway, guys, thanks for being here, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the show. I, I know I am. I love listening to Jay here, man. It's great. Great to meet him as well. Thanks so go ahead, man. For that. Yeah, there's a book called, no, oh, it's the lighting is not that great in here, but it's called The Lure of the Edge. And this woman's name is Brenda Denzler, and she is an academic from University of California. And this is like a, you know, PhD level type academic book printed uh, on scientific passions, religious belief, and the pursuit of UFOs. And I picked this up because my approach, I, I'm generally interested in you know, like real documentation and evidence. I don't, I mean, I do at times engage in speculation, but I usually say when I'm speculating, but I, this yeah, is not good. speculation because uh, on page 148 and 149, she talks about a Brookings Institute, NASA Brookings Institute, 1960 paper that Arthur C. Clarke, who was an illuminist, was involved in. And in that paper, they talked about uh, the UFO phenomenon could be used to discredit to discredit the totality of Christianity. Interesting, yep. very interesting. And they say yeah, that if, if there was a pre, uh, uh, an arrival, uh, that it would completely revolutionize Western theology. Uh, they say even all religions, not just Christianity, but any any Western religion would be completely decimated and. Oh, yes. And, and that's why it's hard, you know, not to see this, you know, I mean, I'm glad, I really appreciate you sharing that it does just fill in more of the blanks. Well, you hear a lot about Project Blue Beam. And, you know, I've mm -hmm. heard about that in the conspiracy world for for years. Um, but here's an actual Brookings Institute paper where they say, if we if we do this, we can really damage Christianity. And all the weird alien news that comes out of the Vatican that will, you know, will baptize these little fellows and they have the Lucifer telescope and whatnot. So perhaps that really is all a part of some big delusion or something they want to create. You know, uh, it's very interesting. But you're right. It, it would change the world. Absolutely. Yeah, but I view, I think it would be a scam and probably in some degree demonic. So I would agree with you on that for sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't put it past them. I think what they do is they have different scenarios that they can use kind of in their card deck, you know? Yeah. Like the Illuminati, the card, Illuminati game, card deck, right? <laughs> like throw, throw down your magic, there, right? the gathering UFO. Uh, oh. thing, right? Yeah. But uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll use it. Uh, they may, who knows? But I think what they probably wanted to do was wait until enough of the population is significantly con convinced of the idea of aliens. Uh, there's actually a chapter in my book where I deal with this, where I try to explode that notion because I, the, I think the reason they haven't done it yet is because they haven't convinced enough people to agree to the alien scenario. Uh -huh. But that is the role that Richard Dawkins and these different atheists play is that you'll notice his whole message is atheism, scientism, Darwinism. Oh, and by the way, aliens. 
Yes, you're right. Their role is to condition people to move into that kind of a weird spirituality. That is fascinating, man. Um, I want to ask you this too, because I'm sure the people are curious. First off, I appreciate. Well, I'm I'm proud of you for uh, being able to shoot the episodes of the show. Are you able to tell us what it's called and when we can watch it? And I imagine it'll be at the yeah. Buzzsaw. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It, it'll. It's kind of the style of uh, the way Sean Stone does Buzzsaw, but it's basically just going to be me and Jay Weedner in director's chairs with a sort of a theater set. Uh, and we just kind of go back and forth on clips. So I wrote about 90% of the script for all 17 episodes. Um, I chose all the clips. I don't know for sure if all of them made it into the final product because it's right <laughs> now it's actually in post-production. So I don't, I don't know how the final, will, but it, everything that I saw looked really cool. I'm very confident. I think it's going to be very interesting. If you like the topics that you and I are talking about right now, you'll like that show. So it should run, we're expecting in July. Uh, it will be on some cable, it will be on some satellite. Uh, it'll be on Amazon Prime, um, Roku, all that kind of stuff, obviously, uh, because Gaia is a streaming network sent, uh, primarily, but they also do uh, air on some cable and, and satellite networks like uh, Xfinity, stuff like that. But um, So it should be in about a month. Um, Cool. And, uh, yeah. So the episodes are basically 30 minute episodes where we choose a director or a film or a series and we just kind of break it down in the, in the style of what I do in my book or the way that we're talking about it, where we look at a 30 minute clip or excuse me, a 30 second clip. And then we say, Oh, well, what was going on here? Notice the symbolism there of, you know, but it's not just, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, there's a lot of content. There are a lot of depth. So it's going to be, it's going to be pretty heady. It's not going to just be, you know, uh, well, there's an all eye and that's, that's kind of, yeah. yeah. Wow, dude. I, yeah, that sounds like it's going to be my new favorite show already. I'm excited. And I also want to ask you this, speaking of television and whatnot, another show I've been really into lately, uh, just because of visually and the story it's telling is American gods. Have you had a chance to see that yet? No, man, everybody keeps saying, Hey, check this out. And, uh, I just been so busy with trying to shoot videos and, uh, do new articles. So I write a lot of articles on theology and, you know, other topics too, that I just haven't got around to it yet, but should I, I, I don't know. Everybody keeps saying it. Yeah. Yeah. I would. It's very, it's just about the old gods fighting against the new gods, like the gods of technology and drugs and stuff like and sex and whatnot. But it's very interesting. Now it's written by Neil Gaiman who mm -hmm. did the uh, graphic novel way back. And mm -hmm. I know he's probably not uh, very going to take very much a Jesus positive Jesus type approach to it, but I guess we're going to find out tonight because tonight's the eighth episode and it's called come to Jesus. Hmm. What was interesting is I think it was last week they had a, they had Jesus in it for like five minutes and the sequence was actually very interesting. It started off with a bunch of people uh, seemingly in Mexico wanting to cross you know the river and get over into America. Huh. And there's probably twelve of them, and one of the guys was afraid he couldn't swim. You know he was, he was scared, so his wife or girlfriend they were crying, but she had to go, so they all went into the water. And then this guy says, "Okay, fine, I'm going to go ahead and try." So he starts following the rest of the people, and of course he starts to sink. So next thing you know, this hand comes in through the water, grabs his hand, pulls him out. He wakes up and he's on the other side with everybody else and they're all happy. And the guy's, you know, just looking up and it's a Jesus figure. It's a guy that looks like the Jesus figure we've been given. And then what's very interesting is behind the Jesus figure, it looks like a light starts to illuminate him, right? Mm. And it is, but it's not anything supernatural. It's, it's pickup truck lights. <laughs> so behind him pulled up like six trucks all these rednecks get out with guns and start killing all the people that just crossed the border, <laughs> even shooting Jesus. And they shot his stigma on him, right? So he's down in the cross position dead. And then uh, they do a close up on the guns and they all got crosses hanging off their guns as they're shooting. So these are the religious, <laughs> you know, it's like, and I mean, I was just like, brilliant you know if you really see it for what it is you know what i mean and i'm of course i, I believe in christ and i believe you know i try to be a follower but i look religion i'm not a fan of organized religion i've gone into that in other shows and stuff it uh -huh. is what it is but that's why it was nice to see that treated i thought very realistically because it really hmm. is that difference between true faith and religion in, in many ways but go ahead yeah i don't know about uh, that show other than what you just told me. So it's, it's totally new to me other than people saying, Hey, watch American gods. But, uh, really all I've, I've been following twin peaks pretty close, uh, in terms of, you know, on, ongoing series right now. And 
what's really wild about it is that it's in a similar way mm -hmm. as kind of showing you the spiritual realm and it's all about possession you know the character bob yeah demon bob is possessing cooper and he's possessed him for 25 years and now we 25 years later we're seeing the effects of of bob and the fbi is investigating this but they don't really there's like this code word blue rose for supernatural cases or cases of demonic possession and so i wonder if you know you know that, that maybe david lynch is hinting at the possibility of you know these real cases where uh, there have been ritual crimes because that's really what it is the whole show is about the ritual murder of laura palmer yeah and it's so, interesting in the, in, the, in the news series how uh spirits cross over from the lodge that mm -hmm. dimension into ours through the black all-seeing eye into a mm -hmm. cube and then uh yeah. I, I'll, I'll admit though i think it's donnie is that who cooper is basically right now is that the name and of uh, naomi whatever her name is Do you oh dougie dougie man i'd starting to wear thin honestly i really love <laughs> the show but i wish that he would snap out of it <laughs> so, no i know we're all getting kind of tired of this idiot goofy dougie it's like come on dude is that cooper yes okay good well well is there anything else you wanted to cover uh this because you know i just noticed i've had john now it's we're going up on two hours and uh you know i, I feel like i could keep on going and you could too but i, I know you've got a life over there <laughs> and i don't want to keep you on too long and i'd also like to hope to bring you on another time as well yeah man but, yeah we could do this another time and chat on some more topics uh, some different films but uh no i think that pretty much covers uh everything um if anybody's interested in the book you can get it directly from jay's analysis there's a tab uh and it, it helps me out if you get it from me rather than amazon because even though it's a little cheaper on amazon i do provide a signed copy and then basically yeah. authors make authors make nothing from amazon it's a total scam uh, but we're with that yeah we got to support, support each other go ahead but yeah so you can uh, if you want the book it's it's everybody likes it I, I think i have almost 85 stars in five months and uh, 95 percent you know thumbs up on it so uh 404 footnotes 363 pages all kinds of movie stuff geopolitics philosophy and then i also have a subscription thing for lectures talks podcasts philosophy talks interviews uh, at Jay's analysis for four ninety five a month if you're interested in that. So, yes, well, sold and sold, sir. I mean, I'm glad you had a chance to mention that. I'll leave links anyway to your work okay, underneath cool. this once it's uploaded. But uh, man, I could just sit here and listen to you forever. It went by so fast. It's a real pleasure to meet you, and yeah, I'm going to dig even more into your work. I already thought I knew so much about you and what you've been doing for years, but now I, I'm seeing you're covering so much more. Um, been a pleasure, man. Uh, I, I really loved it. And I'll have you on again sometime. Oh, I appreciate it. Thanks, man. And uh, yeah, I look forward to talking in the future. Apology next time. Absolutely. Yeah. Be great. All right, Jay. We'll take care and I'll talk to you later, man. All right, man. Have a good night. You too. Bye bye. All right, guys. I'll jump over here to the chat now and see what's going on for a moment and how we're all doing i hope you're doing well i hope you guys enjoyed the show man that was uh for me that was awesome uh, i really loved talking to jay uh what a great mind he has uh i love that he he's very reasonable as well with his research you know it's not a lot of woo woo i like some of the woo woo in my stuff i admit this <laughs> sometimes i do the woo but this is a man who's done some deep research and uh, can back up all of his theories and ideas and uh or his ideas He's got some wonderful theories as well. So I'll go ahead and stop with that now. I could ramble on and on and on. But uh, guys, I got much love for you. I hope you enjoyed the show this evening. Uh, thanks so much to my mods as always. And uh, stay tuned. I will have some more shows coming up this week. All right, guys. So take care of yourselves. Have a great Sunday night. We'll talk to you later.